it's easy. You can set it. You forget it. You can walk away. The, 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 um, uh, they have, usually have 25 year warranties um, on, the, on the panels. A lot of the panels were sent in space 40 years ago, still working. It's actually moisture that kind of deteriorates it. But anyway, this is the easy button. And, and it's the quickest way to kind of get your, your return on your money. This, you have pumps, you have glycol, you have motors, you have controls, you have a lot of things that are kind of confusing, and uh, a lot of head scratchers, and how well you design the system uh, can basically dictate how much, what your payback's gonna be, so it, it's, it's a wide variation. I was gonna say, if you had a pot of money and you just wanted to press the easy button, <coughs> hit the payback. Uh, I'm sorry, hit the, uh, the solar PV side. Um, so that, that leads me, of course, I'm talking about solar thermal. Why would I talk about solar thermal? Um, this is, I think it's called River, Riverdale in, um, in Canada. <clears throat> this is the, the model of net zero energy. Um, kind of the way they do it is they maximize the building envelope. Um, so you have a, a low heating load and cooling load. <clears throat> and then you heat your house and cool your house with, with heat pumps. And then you use solar PV to offset all that. So over the course of a year, net zero, you know, I may produce more in the summer than I do in the winter, but uh, it, 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 it all nets out to my, my loads, and my loads and my production kind of equal to zero. Um, and so this is kind of the model of what the model baby of the net zero energy house. Um, it's kind of nice, they've kind of got it dialed in like that. Um, there are a couple of net zero energy houses in Alaska. You don't have to have solar thermal for that. There's a great um, green building advisor, this guy named Martin Holliday, uh, who writes a lot about energy efficiency, renewable energy systems, etc. Title of one of them is called, Is Solar Thermal Dead? And he asked this because he says, okay, say I've got a, a, a pot of money and um, you know, $10,000 or so produces the same amount of energy whether I'm using solar PV or solar thermal. And um, <clears throat> the difference is that solar, solar thermal, it's, uh, it produces three times the amount of energy per, per square foot of area that faces the sun than solar PV. So what that means is, say on my house, I could put, I'm just gonna make up a number, 100 square feet of solar thermal for the same amount of cash, but if I wanted to go, so if I wanted to do just solar PV, and forget the pumps, forget the glycol and all the complicated stuff, just do PV, I'd have to have 300 square feet to, to make the same amount. So if you got the real estate, it's easy. But it doesn't mean there aren't, if you read his article, it's a short article, about that long. Um, you know, he's like, it actually, he's arguing it doesn't make a whole lot of sense for places down south. Um, in terms of energy, because the price of energy is much cheaper down there. And he's saying up in northern latitudes, actually, he says there is some reason for it because the price of fuel is higher, etc. I'll talk about it a little bit here. <clears throat> so there are two categories of solar, of solar thermal systems. We have one which is domestic hot water. So what's this doing? This is just basically taking sun, heating up some glycol. There is a pump, that's a symbol for a pump. That's moving, you know, water and glycol, usually glycol around here. There's a controller that says, hey, look, it's hot out here. This is my tank of water that I'm trying to heat for, say, taking showers. So if it says, hey, it's hotter out here than it is in here, turn the pump on, make everything hot, heat this tank up, use the water, take showers. You could also, well, you could also heat this, hot, this tank of hot water with a boiler. <coughs> the other... The other category is um, space heating. It gets a little more complicated, but that's where you're using the heat for, say, inflow radiant heat. There are some people who try to do this for baseboard heat. Um, not a really great idea. Um, and the, maybe even um, uh, like forest air, some people have tried it with that. There's no, not a great idea either, and I'll get into that. So the next thing is, <clears throat> remember, you know, I was sort of tailoring this for contractors. If you have a conversation with your, with your client, ask them why. Like, why do you want to do this? Because there's one end of the scale where it's like, well, this is good for the environment. It's something I believe in. Um, I'll, this side of the scale. Then you have other people who are like, nope, I'm all about investment. I want my quickest return on, on investment. Um, I'm on this side of the scale. 
Now, the truth of the matter is most people are kind of somewhere in the middle, maybe lean a little more this way or lean a little this way. I've, I've had conversations with people who have been kind of on either side. Another reason why is that, well, with the Alaska housing, with the um, home energy rebate program, they want to get an extra star on the home energy rebate program. Now, right now, like today, you can't do that. But it's working, they're working towards that. And maybe, hopefully within the next year, we can have the same conversation and say, ah, because this person put solar thermal or solar PV or wind or whatever on the house, you got to bump you into the six star rating. Another reason too, there, there are other uh, programs out there called the Living Building Challenge, Net Zero, and LEED, and these are certification certifying bodies that said, oh yeah, you know, there's some people who kind of greenwash and say, oh well, I'm all solar and this and that, and then these are the certifying bodies that says, oh yeah, he's all solar and this and that. Um, <clears throat> Lead, just so you know, this is we're the farthest nor north lead platinum building in America. You're sitting in it right here. Um, it's kind of a good, kind of pretty neat bragging right, right? But you know, it takes it's pretty tough to keep that accreditation up. When we did this building edition, we wanted to maintain. You have to expand the um, accreditation, but we want to maintain lead platinum from over here. So this building edition, in order to get our lead platinum, um, this one is designed to be supplemented or actually have no fossil fuels heat this building addition and I'll show you how we did that. So what are the barriers for solar thermal? <clears throat> for one, um, first for anybody, for you and me, you still have to have cash. You still have to put that up front if you don't have that cash. There are some um, there are some banks out there, lending institutions that may lend loan to you. Last I checked, um, Spirit of Alaska was lo loaning loans out for this kind of um, these kind of ventures. It's been a few years, maybe they've changed that. Another barrier is that it can get complex in a hurry. You'd be scratching your head and calling your installer in a hurry. <clears throat> and then the last thing is, um, say you're, it's a new construction system, right? Uh, a, a new construction house, and you go to the bank and you say, hey, this, this house I'm gonna build, and it's gonna cost me $250,000 to build, right? So they're gonna go and look at it, and they're gonna say, well, look, now, first off, my house is going to say, you know, I'm going to have solar PV, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to have solar thermal, I have solar PV, I'm going to have this awesome building envelope, and it's going to be the world's most energy efficient house out there. But when you go to the appraiser, because it's going to cost you 250, actually, it's use a real number, $280,000. So it's going to cost you $280,000 to do all of this. When I go to get the bank loan, the appraiser is going to go out there and say, okay, how many square feet is it? Do they have granite countertops? There's no check mark for solar thermal. There's no check mark for a building envelope um, that's like that. Uh, so they're only going to give you, they're going to say, well, this thing's really worth $250,000. Well, really, it's going to cost you eighty dollars if you get all this stuff in there. So that's a real barrier. That means you've got to put $30,000 out of pocket to get there if those are numbers that work for you. So right now, believe it or not, CCHRC helped work with AHFC to develop a, an energy um, help me out there, uh, energy appraisal tool. So the energy appraisal tool is an optional thing where your auditor can go in and say, okay, yeah, they got granite countertops, they got the so many square feet, but how much energy do they consume? Because if they're, if, if they're saving a lot of energy, if they're not paying an extra $500 a month because they've got an energy efficient envelope or they're offsetting their heat, their, uh, heat or energy with renewable energy sources, then that's the extra 500 bucks they can put into a mortgage. So it increases your, your borrowing capacity. Right now, the, uh, the appraisers don't have to use that tool. Um, there are some like HFC loans that say, well, we're going to want that, that uh, appraiser to use that tool. Uh, but it's kind of funny, right? The appraiser gets the 700 bucks, whether they spend you know, seven hours on it or you know, three hours on it. Um, and so it, it is a barrier for them because they're not getting paid extra, but this extra tool it takes a couple extra hours or an hour or two. To, to look into and come back with the right, um, a right number, and and there are some who are resistant to it. That might change. It'll change if it, everyone has to do it. So anyway, I want you to look at perspective, right? People say, okay, well, why why do you want to do solar thermal? Well, the most common word I, the most common reason I hear is that, well, I want to turn my boiler off in the summertime. Kind of makes sense to me, right? Because you've got all the solar availability. This is winter, this is summer, this is winter. This is how much solar energy is produced. You'll see this curve a lot. It should come to no surprise to you. 
but you get all if you you got the ability to get all this free heat in the summertime, it just burns me to have that boiler turn on. So what if you had two collectors? This is all turnkey. This is not do it yourself. Okay, do it yourself a whole lot cheaper. Um, this is like you're paying somebody to go do that. So let's say that you've got you know two collectors, um, domestic hot water only in Fairbanks. Um, for this for average house, okay. So don't hold these. These numbers can vary a bit, right? But I want to use this as a baseline number, okay? This system can offset about 170 gallons of fuel a year. That works out to about nine and a half years. What does that mean? How big are those collectors here? Those are, so we were using two, two by eight collectors, I believe. <coughs> this happens to be a picture of my house. Um, like most of you, it's the biggest investment I ever made. So you can bet, you can bet darn well that, you know, I've done, I did my homework to figure out, well, where, where should I take this pot of money that I've got or I'm going to borrow and ask for and pay for the next 30 years? Um, where will I get my quickest return? So <clears throat> we said, well, okay, let's take this house. And I, and I, I had different configurations of options. And said, so let's look at, let's look at whether I have an R19 wall versus an R50 wall versus an R70 wall, where do I get my payback, right? So the baseline comparison, you have to have some sort of baseline comparison. If I compare everything to a stick frame house without an insulation, man, the payback's like, you know, in decimal points of a year, like half a year, two tenths of a year, right? But um, R19 was kind of, was the baseline here because at the time that was the, um, the, the baseline comparison. So we said, if I had R, R value with an R50 wall, I'd be burning 354 gallons a year. If it was 117, it'd be two, two, 292. Um, basically, by going with, by going with uh, the, the R70 wall, we're saving 323 gallons of fuel a year. Um, look at what this means, what this looks like. This curve says, this is the R value. So if I increase the R value, how much heat am I using? And this is, millions of BTUs per year. So you can see R19 is real, you can take a giant step just by going to about R30. And you'll notice that it's around R30, which is the new building energy efficiency standards are gonna be requiring you to get about here with the new construction of houses. And then if you get, as you get a little bit more insulation, that the curve kind of stays about the same, it starts flattening out. This is where I, I saw the next step and said, well, you know, R70 looks about right. So, the next question was, well, what's the difference between putting triple pane windows versus double pane windows? Well, in this case, it was 77 gallons of oil. What's the average house in Alaska in Fairbanks used? It's about 1,200 gallons of fuel a year. So just to give you a sense of what 77 gallon means versus 360 gallons. Here's a big one, it's air sealing, right? You have all these leaks. Um, ability for warm air that you just paid the heat up for to, to escape. And then it's replaced by cold air that now you got to heat. <clears throat> um, I decided that the minimum air change per hour that I would even consider is three air changes per hour. What they you can do is get a blower door test. Someone puts a, a, a pressure on your house, negative pressure on your house, and then you know basically they measure how many holes are in there. And if, if we went from a three air changes per hour to 50 pascals, to, in this case, in my case, it was 0.45. That right there saved me 138 gallons of fuel a year. What does this number mean? The average leak, air leakage of uh, Alaskan homes is about seven. Now, it's <coughs> really leaky homes out there. Um, it used to be that the, uh, it used to be the code said that, the, I guess it was ICC, was eight air changes per hour. And then they changed it to go to, recently, to three air changes per hour. But in Alaska, we said, man, that's too tough. We can't do this. It, it's too hard. No one's going to do it. So now we went out for the next piece and said, well, now four air change per hour is a known and side, side note. It doesn't take much to do this. It's not a major cost investment. It's just a little bit of time and a little bit of careful attention. Roof insulation going from 12 inches to 30 inches, 30 gallons a year. Heat recovery, you guys, heat recovery ventilators going from none at all to having one is about 153 gallons a year. Um, keep, keep that in mind. Remember these numbers, compare these numbers to how much that solar offset is 170 gallons a year. 
So that's why I'm calling this keeping perspective. Where, where's your lowest hanging fruit? Here's another thing. And we'll get into the detail of solar thermal. I'm not, not losing you yet. Building energy efficiency standards is called bees. The old bees basically classified your house on the five star rating, right? So if you had like a 90 or, or higher, you were classified as a five star house, right? If there's 93 or higher, you're five star class. Well, they said, well, let's take, because we're going to update these. So let's take this house that would be a five star rating in, in bees and <coughs> apply, you know, the new B standards. That, that, that house that would have scored a 90 is now an 83. It's no longer a five star house just because we applied the new B standard to it. So what does it take to get that 83 back up to a five star house? Well, for one, what if we take domestic hot water, the, the uh, you know, whatever, heating, water heating mechanism from 51% to 60%? That's not a giant technological leap. That's just a few extra bucks when you're paying for your water heater. What about a boiler efficiency from 80 to 84%? Again, that's not going to a, a condensing boiler. That's just a little bit more efficient boiler. Air tightness, what do you want from seven to three? Well, that's because um, what does it take to do that? It doesn't really cost much of anything except for some time, a little bit of time. What if the ceiling insulation went from R38 to R48? The oil use goes from 1,452 gallons a year down to 887. So the cost to do this is like 1,100 bucks. So you're saving this much a year, so your, your simple payback is half a year. So keep, yeah, so to, yeah. boil, to, to raising the boiler to that from 80 to 84, I mean, you're, you're, is that all you're talking about, you know, um, with outdoor reset perhaps and a exactly. damper? And I can't give you the details specifically because that was someone's work prior to me, um, but I have it. I can give you the answer if you wanted the answer. We had it. I didn't include it in this because I didn't wait too okay. into the week. So I'll give you the specifics if you want it. All right. You got it. So, okay, so back to perspective, you know, this cost me after re <coughs> tax credit and stuff, uh, six about 100 bucks, saved me about 700 a year. Um, the, the moral of the story is, pick the lowest hanging fruit first, you got a pot of money. <coughs> I recommend you throw it in the building envelope, and then what you have left over, you can do something more with it. You can do a lot with it. I talked to you too about Alaska housing. Um, right now, there's no mechanism to, if you've got a solar thermal system, you got no mechanism to get credit for that. CCHRC is working with um, Alaska housing right now to, to get a mechanism so the raters can go out and say, hey, this guy has a, has a place for solar, uh, solar thermal or PV. Um, they've got some software to evaluate how much energy they can make. And is that number right? So this software, they use a particular software, they get credit for using it, and, and we know it's a real number, it's not just something pulled out of the air, and you can apply it, um, and you get your, your credit for it for the six star, uh, five star plus or six star program. And if it's not a program that's already in the system, they have a means for getting it there. So the very, 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 very first thing, now we're really into solar thermal, I promise. The very first thing you need to think about when you're thinking about solar PV or solar thermal is where do you live? Because there are people who are like, oh yeah, I live in the woods. And when the sun, between 11 o'clock and 1 o'clock, man, the sun is just baking, you know? I know I get some free, from some free energy with that. Well, you really need to do something, use some sort of tool that can analyze the shading. So there's a tool here. I should have brought it up. I'll set it up at break. It's called a solar pathfinder. This, it's one version. There, there are a couple others. There's another one I'll show you you can use your phone with. But the idea is it, it's got a fisheye view of the world. You can see here somebody looking at, and you can see the, the trees um, in the distance. There's a, this is called a sun path diagram. So what this means is it traces the path of the sun at any point in the year. I'll know that at basically 9 o'clock in the morning on March 1st, the sun's going to be right here. Uh, you know, at June, in June 1st, or June 21st, in the middle of the day, it's going to be here, and here we are in December, it's going to, this is the path that the sun's going to take. And if you take a picture of this fisheye view of the world and trace it out, there's software that calculates all this for you, you get to see that, well, when the sun's over here, it's shaded. Oh, and now we're getting sun, 
Now it's shaded. Well, what if I took a chainsaw of these trees and opened this up this area? You can get, the software can produce something that looks like this and say, ah, you're going to save this much energy a year. This many dollars, this many gallons of fuel. Say you got it, just a sunny thought. I mean, hey, there are no trees on my property. I know this is good. You don't necessarily have to do that. And there are free tools out there. There's a tool out there called System Advisor Model, made by NREL. Kind of cool, right? You can do this for solar thermal, you can do this for solar PV, you can do this for wind. And you put a little bit techy. It's a little bit techy. The thing that annoys me is that this is made by the National Renewable Energy Laboratory, right? Department of Energy. Um, you have to enter uh, how many cubic meters your solar thermal tank is, right? So instead of how many gallons of water a day are you using, how many cubic meters of water a day are you using? So you got to do some conversions. It's kind of annoying, in my opinion. I'd expect it if it were European. There's another app out there that it's $16. It's, it's by, made by Co-Moving Magnetics, and it's, uh, it's called Solar Shading. It's a phone app. <coughs> what you do is you basically got an accelerometer and a compass in your phone, and you, you can hold it up and trace where the, hold it up and trace the tree line, right? So you would, this is what you'd be looking at on your phone, and you can trace this whole tree line. You have to go all the way around, you have to be real careful. What does that look like? And it will come out and say, ha, look, this is where your shading is, this is where the sunny, sunny sides are, uh, and this is how much you can produce, how much energy you can produce a, a month. Kind of a neat little deal. We, we proved it out with, against the Solar Pathfinder <coughs> and, um, and a few other programs that are out there. And uh, 16 bucks is pretty cool. The, the Solar Pathfinder, I think, is more on the order of 200 bucks maybe more or maybe less uh, once you have factor in the software. So, how did, difficult did it work with your, what you guys see here? Did it work? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, did it compare pretty close to what you guys see? It compared really well. Yep, it sure did. I don't know if they have it for, I know it's an Android app. I don't know, hey Ness, it, they do not have it for iPhone. They don't have it for iPhone? Right. Okay. We tested it in two locations, just here out front where the PV panels are, and then also where the solar thermal panels are in the village, in the sustainable village, and it came out to within 5% of what the Pathfinder found. Mm -hmm. so. <coughs> the big question is, how difficult is it to install solar thermal? And with a simple system, I'd ask you, can you have you ever installed a sidearm water view? Is there anybody that doesn't know what that is? You don't have to raise your hand, but if you don't know what a sidearm water <laughs> heater is, then you may not want to be doing this yourself. But basically, a sidearm water heater is basically just a water heater that has some coils in it that you can hook up to your boiler so that the boiler heats up that tank of water. The, the fluids in your boiler don't actually touch the fluid of the water in the tank, so you're not necessarily drinking or showering in, in glycol. But if you have ever installed this, and there's some plumbers in here that have, you can do the solar drum. <coughs> You got yet another, I told you we got two categories. We got domestic hot water, we got solar uh, space heating. We also have two categories of it. It's called closed loop systems and drain back systems. Here's how this works, right? Um, here's your tank of water. Here's my collector. <clears throat> These little pumps, what they do is they circulate. This is the same thing. This is just with a tube. This is a coil in the tank. This is the heat exchanger for this tank. This right here, this is like taking a cheap tank and adding a little flat plate exchanger. I'll talk a little bit about that if you don't know what that means later on. It's kind of a cheaper version of doing the same thing. But you have to have two pumps. Anyway, so the bottom line is you have glycol that just gets heated, brought down here, cooled, heated, brought down here, cooled. Same thing here. It's, it, it only gets heated and cooled. And if this whole system, let's say this is water in this tank. At what temperature does water boil? 212. Yeah, um, if it gets to if it gets to boiling, you're gonna have a problem. You're gonna have basically a bomb, and you have to, uh, the preventatives for that. They put the, they call relief valves or pop off valves. So basically, they're set at maybe 205, and so or, or and, and at 205 or 200 degrees, they start popping off and venting so that you don't ever boil anything, so you don't have a bomb. So let's just say that there's a solar controller in here that says. I'm some temperature, and if it's warmer than me up here, than it is down here, cycle this thing off. Well, what happens if 
it gets to 200 degrees. The controller says, shut it down. I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to boil anything. I don't want my pop-off valves to spill water onto the floor. So what it does, it tells everything to stop. Well, guess what? The sun may still be shining, and you're going to bake this glycol. There are some glycols out there that can handle 325, some claim even close to 400 degrees. It takes quite a bit to get that much temperature. But either way, if you do that a few times, you'll, you'll, you'll bake your glycol, and it won't be any good anymore. What kind would we recommend to, uh, if you want to try to boil her off? Either one of those really get your boiler going so for a I don't think I understand the question. If you want to check your boiler off, yeah. can you, do you have to do like a double loop? Like this on the right? Yeah. Do you have to do that or do you have to do this? If you want to shut your boiler off. If I want to shut the boiler off? Oh, yeah. Um, I, I know there are people who have done this and they just put the Dow Frost HD in here. And that's good to about like 325 degrees, I think is what they rate it for on that. Um, it can only happen a few times before it's, it starts, the inhibitors break down and then you can start corroding pumps and things of that nature. It takes a lot to get there. So there are people who do this and they do it just fine. And they're willing to say, this, that situation is not going to happen very much. I'll just change the glycol out. If, if that's something that's like in your vocabulary or something you want to do, then by all means do that. This is the type of glycol that I'm talking about. The other way you do this is called a drain back system. So here's these are three different versions of drain back systems. You see how quickly this can get complicated. Let's start with this one. Let's say that at your house you've already got a big water tank that you're heating up, but you want to put up solar thermal. And because Bruno said drain back's a good idea, you want to you want to get a drain back system. So what you can do is you can get a, a drain back tank with a coil in the side inside, and it's going to be like several hundred dollars, like six. If not cheap, and you need to shift your panels. So here's the way this works. Um, there's a call. There, there, the sun's shining. It's warmer up here than it is in here. So this pump turns on, and it sucks the water down from this drain back tank and sends it through the collector. So it's warming up this drain back tank, getting hot, getting hot. Well, now this pump turns on and, and pulls the heat from it and dumps it into your tank. So you got two pumps that are running. And now, say this tank gets to, because this is water on this side, say that tank gets to 200 degrees. What do we got to do? We got to shut it all down. Well, when it's a drain back system, everything's sloped. So the pump shut off, and all the glycol in here just goes right back into this drain back tank. We've got a drain back tank here in our, our uh, south lab here, if you want to take a look at it. Drain back tank doesn't look like that. Bruno, you said glycol. Uh, drain back system uses glycol? Not water? Um, that's funny. Yeah, all the ones that I know of uh, in Alaska use uh, the glycol on the solar side. But there's somebody I talked to the other day who says, no, we're going to try water. And I say, you just like keep me on the phone and I want to see how that goes for you. <laughs> Theoretically, it should work, and on paper it should work. It's just that it gets cold. And what if the situation occurs where you know, the sensor is placed in a way that it gets hot up here, but down here it's still frozen? And I have water. Could I, you know, could it freeze? Could it build up? There's just so many opportunities for for uh, replacement. <laughs> <laughs> service opportunities. Sewer service opportunities. That's, that's the word I was looking for. Like that. Um, so that's one option, right? So this is still a drain back system. What if you want to pay the six hundred dollars for this little ten gallon tank that has a coil in it? You can do that with an empty tank, a little thirty gallon tank that's like. 150 bucks from Lowe's, maybe they're not that cheap. And then you can put a, an external exchanger on the outside, still you have to have two pumps. So you have the water on this side of the exchanger, you have the glycol on this side, the two pumps have to run. Same principle applies when, when for whatever reason it's time to shut down, everything just drains back. Here's the other way, and this is kind of, my opinion, the better way, if you start from scratch, because you notice there's only one pump one, two here, one, two here. This one only has one pump. So this is just a cheap, cheap old tank that can hold about however many gallons. How many gallons do you need? Well, let's say you've got a one eight by 10 collector. usually holds about a gallon of water or, or flight call. So you've got 10 collectors. You know you've got at least 10 gallons in the, in the collectors. That tank needs to be at least 10 gallons, plus however much fluid is in your piping. So I'd say maybe 15 gallons, you know, just to give you a sense of what that means. And the 
this is a special tank that's got a coil in the middle. So now that heat is generated, heat directly, right, directly heats your water. Um, this doesn't necessarily mean it's the cheapest way because these tanks can easily be $1,800. <coughs> um, Got a question, how do you avoid frying your glycol when you need to start the pump up again? You know, if I think that's more of an issue if for whatever reason, because typically the startup temperature is like, well, it's, it's 100 degrees or 120 degrees or 130 degrees because it's 130 degrees out here, 80 degrees down here. <clears throat> that's not going to enough. To, that when, when the cold glycol hits the 80 or 90 or 100 or 130 or even 100, even 200 degree collector, it's not going to fry it. What's the situation where that could occur? Situation that could occur where you have a power outage, <clears throat> and it's been middle of the summer, and it's been baking, and that, and this thing is like 300 degrees, and then all of a sudden we get power back, and then you could you could cook it for a bit, um, but it'll quickly cool. But there's a little bit of it's going to be cooked, and it's going to degrade just a little bit. Of course, with glycol, you check it every few years. You check like you do your boiler glycol. What's that? Like you do your boiler glycol. Like you do your glycol. Like you do your glycol. Like you do your I don't really need to say this because you all live in Alaska, but um, as far as I'm concerned, there's there's not a solar, there's not a, a system out there that doesn't have some sort of backup heat where somebody relies entirely on solar. This, this um, CCHRC is building addition. If you guys look out that window back there, there's a mound, and most of you probably read about this, but we've got a 24,000 gallon tank of water there. And, um, you know, so we're charging that tank in the summer and then sipping off of that in the winter. We just started getting it going. It's been going for just under a month, and it's gone from 40 degrees, it's 85 degrees today, um, and that's just through the spring, so it's charging really quickly. I'll talk about that shortly. Why do we have that? Because we're not just counting on that to heat us up and get us through the winter. We also have a pellet boiler back there. There's just, you gotta have back up. I'm not gonna insult your intelligence by talking about that. So, this is, I talked about flat plate exchangers. This is what a flat plate exchanger looks like. And they can cost anywhere from $100 to $400 to, there's a $1,200 one up there you can look at at breaks in or afterwards. So, what does this mean? Put this in context, right? I've got a pump, I've got my water, I'm circulating the, the pump and the water through one of these flat plate heat exchangers. Flat plate heat exchanger is just a plate with a space and another plate with another space, So and it goes like a sandwich, right? So the fluids from one side, say the water, goes through channel A, not B, but channel A, not B, right? And then the glycol goes down through channel B, but not A, B, but not A. So now the hot glycol, the heat from the hot one, gets transferred to the colder um, fluid. That's how that works. <clears throat> so you'll see there's lots of like pictures and valves and stuff, and if you're an ME, you're like, oh, I, I know what that is, and this is this, this and that valve. You don't want to have to deal with that if you don't want to have to deal with that. You can actually take this stuff here and buy a package like that. So you just go in the store, right? And you're gonna buy a tank that has a coil in it, you're gonna buy this little pump system, oh sorry, a tank that has a coil in it, this little pump system, and some collectors, and that's about it. That's about it. That's kind of the easy button. This is as simple as you get. It's as simple as you get. <clears throat> no drain back. Well, if you do a drain back, right, then you gotta have that extra step where you just have the drain back tank right up here. Right, and that's the little cheap tank you get from um, Lowe's or whatever. Spinard, Arctic Sun. <laughs> uh, anyway. um, this is a nice thing. If you guys know about the, uh, the solar, uh, Sustainable Village. We have something called the HTP Phoenix. And uh, this is a gas, a propane fired water heater that actually has a coil in the bottom. This doesn't show the coil where it's got a coil on the bottom. It's a really nice, clean system. We've got one over there. The coil on the bottom can be quickly hooked up to a um, solar thermal system. So now you're not, if you've got a super energy efficient home and you can use all this heating, all this water for heating your water and say your space heating, as we do on one of the houses in the southeast house of this uh, sustainable village, 
this is kind of a one-stop shop. It's, it's pretty penny though, this is about $5,500. So, I'm going to try to minimize my numbers and minimize the graphs. But we're a research center, so there's going to be some kind of data. Let's say, for instance, you've got a house in, in Fairbanks, and you've got three 4x8 panels on your house. And your house uses about 80 gallons of hot water a day. That's kind of an average number that pops up fairly often. What this is showing me is the gallons, and gallons of oil per month um, that you would use to heat that hot water. That blue line says, okay, in January I'm going to be burning 12 gallons, in February 12 gallons. It's pretty constant if you're using 80 gallons of water a day. Let's say, for instance, that I'm going to take these three collectors, put them up my house, and tilt them at 49 degrees. In January, I'm not really producing anything, but in February, I'm producing about five gallons of of oil worth of energy. So that means instead of buying 12 gallons of oil that month, now I'm just buying seven. And then around somewhere in March, guess what? I'm producing 15 <laughs> gallons. So that around March, I'm not buying any more gap, any more oil to heat my hot water. We're just talking hot water here. Now look, I have the capability of producing more, but you know what? If I can't use that heat, I'm not really offsetting myself by you know 17 gallons of oil. If I'm using 12 gallons of oil and I can produce at least that much, that's, that's all the energy you're going to offset. Compare that to PV. If you had PV, if, if you're using the electrons in your house and all of a sudden your house isn't using any, or you're producing more electrons than your house is using, then it gets to go back to the grid and you get credit for that. Here, solar thermal, it just means I don't really get credit for the ability to produce more water than I can. And no, no, I just looked that up. It looks like eight cents to what Gold Valley is saying. On the avoided cost for a producer, so eight cents on the dollar. So we pay twenty three cents, but if we spill back onto the onto the grid, um, they're going to give us credit for eight cents of that. <laughs> so that's a third. Um, I have two lines here. What do the two lines mean? Well, the two lines mean that if I tilt it at forty nine degrees from horizontal versus eighty five degrees, the why would you do it at eighty five degrees? Well, maybe you want to slap it on the side of your house. Um, maybe you're worried about snow uh, blocking it. It's not really a problem for solar thermal for blo snow blocking things because just a little bit, of, little bit of heat gives enough heat to cause that snow to just melt away. PV is not that way. So you could actually have, you know, those collectors over there at 85 degrees and sometimes th it's covered with snow. Just not enough heat to, to, to let it fall off. So, okay, what does this mean? Base heat load, 152 gallons of oil a year to just give me hot water. What if I put these collectors up? Well, I'm just saving myself between 106 and 115 gallons of hot water a year. Those are the rules. Yes. What? Since you're, if let's say you're new construction, what to keep you from when we cross the line and we're making too much hot water to use for domestic hot water? Why can't we dump that into a different loop and say warm up the ground? So that's right. That's storage. Mm -hmm. So that's storing the heat. I'm going to get to that. That's an okay. excellent question. The question was, what is there a way I could use this heat somewhere? Yeah, there is. So you kind of shoot for 49 degrees then? I mean, if you want optimum, is that for fair range? I think so. I think so. But, I mean, in this case, you know, maybe you don't have the real estate to do that. I mean, maybe if you've got a roof, you can kind of do whatever you want. Um, I'm, we weren't particularly interested in having, you know, roofs. A panel on our roof. Um, so just architecturally, it didn't fit that picture, right? Um, anyway, space heating. This is the second thing we're talking about. I was talking about before domestic hot water. It was a lot simpler. The space heating. You can see there are a lot more pipes. It gets much more complicated in a hurry. Um, you're already seeing this picture, right? It's going to come up a lot. Tank, heat exchanger, a couple pumps, right? What are we going to do with this water? Well. We have a, a circulator, and it goes to a box we call a heating load. Okay, and if you've done a boiler, you're gonna know that's a joke because that box is a lot more complicated than a box. <clears throat> the other way, of course, is you know you have a coil in the tank, and now you take that heat. You're not necessarily using it for showers, although you can, but it goes to a box called heating load. Same 
Same thing, this is showing you can do all this for a heating load with a drain back tank. One of the things that's worth showing here is that the drain back tank, it's because it's kind of open to air here, the, the pump has to work. It doesn't really have to work to move the fluid that's around here because as it pushes up, the fluid that pushes down kind of helps it push itself back up, right? Where you really need, where you need help is the, it's called the head, and that's the, the distance from the top of the, of the full tank to the top of the collector. That's the head that the, the amount of pressure, the amount of energy, or not really energy, but it's, it, it relates to how big of a pump you need to get that fluid up here. So if you had your drain back tank way down here and you had your collectors 30 feet in the air, you're going to have a big pump. Um, or big pipe, smaller pump, and all that just needs more money. So what, the best thing you can do is get that drain back tank as high as possible. And here's a picture of one that was um, installed. You can see here's where a roof is coming in. The, the collectors are probably right on the other side of this roof. That's a tip worth noting. <clears throat> so remember that little box I showed you? Heating system. This is what this heating system looks like. Right? Um, again, if you're not used to looking at these things, <clears throat> it's really daunting. If you are a plumber, then you say, "Oh well, I see that every day." But you, most people here, I don't think. If we're going to press the easy button, talk to a plumber <laughs> and do the package systems. Um, this can get this can get complicated in a hurry. Although that's pretty simple to say, "Doss," and you probably understand all. Um, let me, one thing I want to show you, this is using this, the best thing you can do for space heating is use this, this fluid, low temperature fluid for, say, um, low temperature circuit flake and for reading heat. Um, here's another example of, like, this is just showing you can do it with a drain back system. The configurations are endless, just endless. Uh, but this is showing how you can tie in a, you know, modulating condensing boiler to do the same thing. In this case, everything is glycol. You notice there's no heat exchanger. Um, here's another one too. Now we don't have as many. That, well, we do have furnaces up here, not as many as say Anchorage. But you know, here's a way you can take that that, that fluid, heat it up, and you know, put it in, a, in a, a heat exchanger that blows air across it, and now you can deliver that heat to your living room. There's 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 an issue with that. And it's a big issue. And that is, it's low temperature heat versus high temperature heat. Go back to this here. Let me go back one more. <laughs> if I want to heat my floors, how warm does that fluid, that glycol, need to be to warm my floors? Someone throw a number out for me. Say it again. What? 100 degrees. 100 degrees. 100, 100, 110? 80. 80, if you got a lot of insulation down there. Um, right. Now, what that means is, this, this tank can get up to, uh, actually if you, have if you have glycol in there, it can get over 200 degrees. So let's just stick with the 200 degree number, right? That means that my boiler can keep this tank at 80, because that's all I need. And the solar can do all the work of charging this up for me. Going above 80, going all the way up to 200 degrees. That's all that capacity. So say the next day that it's, it's cloudy out. Well, I got a 200 degree tank of water that now I can heat my floors with this guy doesn't even turn on. I can do this for two or three or four days, right? Look at this situation. If you're going to blow air across a heat coil, what temperature does that? Throw a temperature number out there for me for the temperature of the heat coil. Yeah, 160, right? So 160. So now that means you got to keep this. Your boiler has to work to keep this thing 160 degrees, right? And then the solar can only go up to. In this case, we're saying 200. That's only 40 degrees of work. That, that solar system can be doing something for you. Under 140 degrees, or 160 degrees rather, that can't do anything. That can't do squat. So it's really, really, really important to assess your heat delivery system. Low temperature heating is the way to go, and really I'll say the only way you want to go for solar thermal systems. Um, I'll give you guys a break in a bit. Let's look at your average house in Fairbanks, okay? This is a hypothetical situation. And your average house in Fairbanks, I think I said, uses 1,400 gallons a year. I'm sorry, go ahead. That's okay. I was going to say, would you say, like, you could say a rule of thumb is if you're going to use, say, hydronic, you know, hot water base for it, or you're going to try to use a 
furnace versus doing it for rating heat, you're going to get like two and a half times the, uh, the heat storage, if you will, from the same tank, right? Because if you said you got 200 degree water and you can bring it down to 160, mm -hmm. and then in the other case, you've got 200 degree water and you can bring it down to 100, I'm just looking for a rule of thumb. Yeah, well then, well, in this case, about delta T, it's about change in temperature. Right. So if it were from 200 to 150, that's 50 degree delta T. If it's 200 to 100, then that's two to one storage okay. you can get. Thank All you. Right. Well said. Yeah, so that means you get twice the storage energy in that, just because you're using a low temperature system and for heating heat. And it turns on twice as early. And it turns on twice as early, exactly, exactly. Okay. No, the radiant collector becomes effective twice as early. Because right. it can start at 100 degrees, not at 150 degrees. Right. So let's take an average house, okay? Average house in, in Fairbanks it doesn't have the building envelope, 1,400 gallons of fuel a year. Now let's say that person just decides because they've got some money, they want to do it. They want to put 10 collectors on their on their roof, okay? What's the heating load, okay? In January, that 1,400, they're gonna they're gonna spend about 260 gallons of fuel that, that month. And then the next month, it's going to be 200. And you see where it goes. And then in, in, in the summertime, it's going to go down. Let's say there's no heating, but they're still heating their water. It stays around, I think we said 12 last time, right? And then, of course, it starts ramping back up in the summertime. That's our load. That's what we're paying for. Let's <coughs> say I take 10 collectors. All right, so now, in January, I'm not getting anything. In February, I'm getting... I don't know, that looks like 25 gallons, 20, 20 gallons of fuel. Well, okay. I would be spending 200, now it's 200 minus 25, so this is how much I'm buying. And of course, as we get closer to, say, March, now I'm producing more than I would have to buy, so that's how much my bill is. And somewhere around April, I don't have a bill anymore. That's kind of cool. I'm producing all this energy I can't use, producing all this energy I can't use, but I don't have a bill. And then, okay, it starts over in September, right? So now I'm not producing as much, but I need this much, so I'm buying that much. Everyone got me? So what does this, what, what would that get me? Those 10, those 10 collectors would get me between 413 and 462 gallons a year. That depends on how the total is. To answer your question, what, what I do, 49 is the better, um, more, more productive output. <clears throat> now, look at that number again. 1,400, this is, this is about a third of your heat load. So, so this hen collector system, it's a big system, is producing about a third of your, of your heat load a year. So now, let's say we don't have an average house. We've got a six-star six house in Fairbanks. Look at their loads. Remember, the other one you're looking way up here for January. Just because they got a six-star, their loads are way down here. So the same rule applies. Remember over there, it was April where you started making your own heat. Well, look, they're making their own heat. They're not paying for oil a little earlier in the year. And now their base heat load, if they didn't have solar, 442 gallons a year, just because they're six star. <clears throat> solar savings, well, it's less, but 290, so basically 300. So now three quarters, three quarters of your energy is produced by the sun just because you got a six star house. You get the point there. So now, Robert, my friend Robert brought up a good point. <clears throat> what if I could take this heat, right? Here we are in our six-star house, right? And it's it's March, and I'm producing my ten collectors more heat than I can use. What if I could take that heat and put it somewhere where I could use it later? Now, ideally, you put it in a place where energy just doesn't go away, but there is no such thing as that. So there are some system losses, et cetera, et cetera. Et cetera. But you basically put it in a highly insulated box tank of water <clears throat> and you store it and you're producing more and you're producing more and you're storing it you're not using it you're not using it but now this is the time of year when your solar stops working it, you're not i'm sorry not doesn't stop working <clears throat> it stops producing as much as you're needing and you're starting to have to, to buy it but guess what if you store that you could actually now because i can pull from my tank guess what i'm not buying oil i'm not buying oil i'm not buying oil <coughs> right around here's where i start buying oil I, it'd be awesome if this thing came all the way back to say March, right? See, that's a heck of a. That's true seasonal thermal storage. I don't know of any systems around here that get true seasonal thermal storage without any kind of help. Um, from the numbers that I've seen in our system and my system at home, this this system 
get you about six extra weeks that you're not having to buy. Hold on. What are you going to do for the next six weeks? you got to have some way to, to supplement that, maybe with a masonry heater or, or wood boiler. Or, or wood boiler. <coughs> you guys, everybody in here I'm sure has seen this house. I actually wish I had a picture of your house. Um, everyone's seen um, uh, Torsen Club's house, and a lot of people have seen Croft Castle's house. These are highly insulated houses. This is technically a, a passive house. Um, <clears throat> He has got a, a 5,000 gallon tank of water in his house that he stores his heat through the summer <clears throat> and then starts using it in the winter. He built the house around this tank, so he stuck it in there, and it was all, it's all insulated now, you know, it's just a steel tank. Another way you could do is you could bury a tank. This is, um, this is actually at my house, and um, this is a tank that's just foam, so this is just foam got some sheets of plywood to protect it, got some wrapped it with bitchethene so it doesn't get wet, and that's a 2,500 gallon tank of what's going to be water as an empty tank. What we did was we cleared our pad, so we're going to build a house because there's going to be a house here. Dug a hole in the ground, took that big old box, stuck it in there, and then built the house on top of it. Um, I like that because I don't have a tank in the house, I don't have to give up real estate for that. There are drawbacks to it. You can't change the tank. I, can, I can't change the tank, that's right. And actually that tank, it's just foam, it's just foam, and we have a liner in it, like a, kind of like a thick swimming pool liner, especially made for that tank. Um, and that's where we fill, we just had cold water wagon fill that up and then the solar heats that up in the summertime. Uh, the liner is good for like 15 years, so I'm going to change that liner. I can change the liner in 15 years. So this is a basic schematic of what it looks like for that house you're just looking at. And what we've got is the collectors, and I have a flat plate exchanger. So this is my big tank, and I pull up this, I pull the water from the heat tank, it goes through the heat exchanger, and it gets heated by the solar. And of course, I can pull the heat from here, and I can heat my floors or take a shower. What happens when this gets too cold, or, or I've used, I, you know, December's rolling around, January rolls around, the stored energy I've got here is, is just drained way down, so I've got to supplement that. i got a masonry heater with a coil in the firebox, and whenever there's a fire, you can heat that, heat that water up. Um, there's more details that go into, it's called stratifying, there are reasons that, that make this work, that system work, where you're just getting a small amount of water for my needs, rather than the whole tank. I'll get into that another time because it gets complicated. But it's not like a regular house where I just I just go in here, set my thermostat, and my boiler takes care of the rest. I gotta think about it. So if I'm gonna go to Hawaii in January, I gotta think about okay. I know I'm out. Uh, I'm not gonna have someone come over and fire this up once every three days. You know, so I don't really have a. I do actually have a backup. I have an electric backup because the bank required me. Another bank department. The bank requires you to. What if this doesn't work? Well, then you need to have electric backup on this, and you have to have electric backup on this. So if my solar system isn't working, I'm just going to pay out the wazoo for electrically heating my water and my, my floor. So I do have that. I could not think about it. I could just say, well, I'll just pay the money. But, you know, it's like having a dog team. You don't just walk away from it um, for something this complex. You want the whole simple system where you were just doing hot water like I showed you earlier on? That's the system. So if you can walk away, the controller does its thing, and you can not think about it for uh, you know, until summertime.